And welcome to our community. Susie Thomas here with you this morning, joined by Samantha Smith of Maslin, better known to all Massalonians as Sammy Kay. Good morning. Good morning. And Sammy Kay is from Spring Hill Farm, one of our favorite places in Maslin. First of all, uh, you kind of go back a ways with Spring Hill, don't you? So tell us a little bit about your connection. I do. Um, I started volunteering at Spring Hill when I was about 10 years old. Um, My mother and grandmother got involved involved. Um, And it was shortly after we had taken a trip to Colonial Williamsburg. My mother had made me a dress and I got to run around and kind of harass the actors there. And I was just like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So when my mother and grandmother were reached out to by the current staff at Spring Hill at the time, um, to talk about quilting, they went, well, do you want to go and run around in costume all day? And I was in third grade I think fourth grade and I was like yeah why not sure Um, so it just kind of all went from there and I volunteered until um, I think the last show I did there was June and I got hired in August 2014 so Mm. I've been there for about a year and a half as director and as director now, a uh, little different than just running around in a costume. Yeah, sometimes um, I still get to do that, though. <laughs> that's so fun. Tell us a little bit about what you do with Spring Hill. Um, I do a little bit of everything. Uh, Spring Hill is a volunteer-run organization, so I am the only paid staff. Everything else is volunteer-run, so I handle memberships, events, um, working with our collection, which is huge. Uh, you wouldn't expect it to be as large as it is. Um making sure we're preserving those the best that we can, Mm -hmm. Um, working with our volunteers directly, doing trainings. I mean, I do a little bit of everything. Yeah, oh, so fun. And how neat to feel like maybe even that you live there. Do you you kind of feel like you live there sometimes? Sometimes I do. Uh, I've pulled 12, 13-hour days before, and I'm like, when am I going home? This isn't home. Mm. Well, some people might wonder where Spring Hill Farm actually is located. Uh, Tell us how best we can get there. Sure. Um, Spring Hill is located on Spring Hill Lane, which is right at the intersection of Wales and Lake Avenue in Massland. Mm -hmm. So there's a big cornfield in front. That's usually the best way I can get people to find us. Um, And our lane is just a little catty corner kind of off from the actual intersection. So some might be wondering, what exactly is it? What is this historic home and what is the story behind it? Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Um, So the home was lived in from about 1821 until 1973. So it's seen about 150 years of history with the family or people living inside the home. Um, It was home to the Roach Wales families who settled Western Stark County, founding the village of Kendall, which later turned into Maslin. Um, and, and you really see Perry, Jackson, all of these townships around it. Uh, Kendall is the first and is bringing people to that part of Stark County. Um, our big kind of claim to fl- fame is that we were stationed on the Underground Railroad. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, I like to say we were on the Underground Railroad before the Underground Railroad started. Wow. Uh, So it's the 1820s. It's really before a lot of the information that we have from the Underground Railroad, which is from about 30 years later in the 1850s, where you get Harriet Tubman and all these big-name people. Um, This is way before that, and it's really providing, the documentation we have is providing a lot of insight into what these people were doing and that this wasn't organized um, network before we even really realized it. When you say that it was lived in from the 1820s through 1973, was mm-hmm. that the same family? It was the Roach Wales family, yes. Mm-hmm. All the way through 1973. Mm-hmm. So the last person to live in that home was? Irene McLean Wales. Uh, her husband was Horatio Wales, the youngest Wales son. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had a lifelong lease until um, after her husband passed away. And she's really the reason why we know as much as we do because she found the Roach Wales papers and she started and essentially dedicated her life Mm -hmm. to finding out more about this house and the history and the amazing things that the people who lived there did. So how how much foresight the Roach Wales had to begin helping people escape from slavery uh, that early on and to be able to be actively participating in it. Tell us a little bit about this fascinating family. Yes. um, So Thomas and Charity Roach were both from New England. They're both Quakers. Um, We have a little kind of acronym we 
for remembering um, Quaker principles, which is sheep, simplicity, honesty, education, equality, and pacifism. Mm -hmm. Um, And you really see these types of qualities within the Roach family. Um, We do know that Thomas and Charity were very, very heavily involved in the abolitionist movement. Um, The reason why they left New England was Charity was in ill health, and they were actually told to move south. Um, but Charity refused to move anywhere that had a slaveholding estate. Um, so they moved out to Ohio instead. It was also, they could get really good land. They were encouraging, the U.S. government was encouraging people to move out to Ohio. Um, it was a newly formed state. And you really see them bringing their beliefs with them. Um, we do know that they helped a runaway, a freedom seeker, when they were living in Connecticut. Um, so this isn't something that they just kind of picked up when they got here. They were really raised in this kind of Mm. anti-slavery family, both families, really. And you see it throughout both of their extended families also, that they're very, very deeply involved with the abolitionist abolitionist movement in Mm -hmm. various ways. And he was a farmer by trade? Uh Thomas was raised actually in a shipping and whaling family, huh, okay. and Charity's father had been a um, a sea captain. So, uh, so of course they came to Ohio. Yeah, come to <laughs> Ohio. Uh, actually, yeah, Thomas's family was from a very, very well-known shipping company, and he, um, his his father and his brother or uncle mm-hmm. actually owned two of the ships in the Boston Tea Party, the Dartmouth and the Beaver. Wow. So they're from very, very big, influential families. Um, and somewhere along the line, Thomas decided that he didn't want to go into shipping and whaling anymore. Um, not really sure of exactly the reasons why, but he decided to get into raising merino sheep instead. Um, and then moved out to Ohio, made the sheep a little bit more hardier so they could withstand Ohio winters. Mm-hmm. But he does a lot of really good work with breeding sheep to make sure that they can produce the fine wool but still withstand our climate out here. How did Charity do in this weather if they came to Ohio for her health? Again, <laughs> not normally what people no, do. No, <laughs> not really better climate. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, Charity had issues. Um, She was never a very, very healthy woman, even as a child. um, We believe that she had some sort of heart issue. Mm -hmm. And then after their son was born, that didn't help. Uh, She was inoculated for smallpox. That didn't help. So she would often spend a few months throughout the winter where she'd be completely bed bound. Um, And then they had would have two girls who worked in the house, Mary Kimberly and Charlotte, who would do kind of the work that she was supposed to be doing just because she physically wasn't able to. Um, But she was a very, very smart woman. Um, Her family really valued education, and so did she. So she probably spent, I have a feeling, most of those times in bed reading a lot. She was an accomplished woman, wasn't she? Tell us a little bit more about her. Oh, um, (laughs) I love talking about Charity. Yeah, no, that's cool. Um, So Charity was raised by her mother by herself. She was the youngest of seven. Um, Her father passed away when she was only six weeks old. His ship Mm. went down. And her mother never remarried. Instead, her mother kept all of her husband's inheritance to make sure it went directly to all seven of her children um, with inheritance laws. If she remarried, then her husband would get her her past husband's entire inheritance. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it could essentially jip her children out of what their father wanted. Uh, So she... Charity really learns from her mother how to be a good businesswoman. She's very, very well educated. Her uh, brother Samuel helps educate her and his five other sisters. Um, And she really does a lot to make sure that she continues to educate herself. And she becomes convinced that the best way to um, end poverty is to make sure everybody has a good education. Wow. Yeah. Um, at the time, you don't have a lot of people who are able to read or write. Simple arithmetic is out of the question. Um, this is very early 1800s, isn't Yes. It? My goodness. Yeah, yes. really thinking ahead. Yes, she is very, Way very ahead, ahead of her time. time. Um, so when she and Thomas are together, they actually form a business deal, which 
first of all, she shouldn't have been able to do because as a woman, she can't own any property. Um, right. You knew how to embroider. Yeah. That was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's really, um, but but you do see when we're finding out more that women like Charity's mother or like Charity would become really well-educated women of sea captains. They would be running their husband's business when he was out at sea. So you're really finding that there's more women that are well-educated than we originally expected. Um, but it's still not, it's, it's all wealthy women. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. you have to be coming from a very, very privileged family to be able to do this. Um, wow. So Charity thinks that everybody should get an education <laughs> and makes a business deal with her husband that any time twin lambs are born in his flock, one will go to her. Um, now, of course, Thomas could have just been like, okay, sure, honey, whatever you say. But in his records and his documents, he is meticulously noting which sheep belong to his wife. Wow. So we know he's taking her seriously. Um, the reason why she wanted to do this was she wanted to build a school. And she does. It becomes the Charity School of Kendall. And it's founded after her death, unfortunately. She never gets to see it become a reality. Um, Arvine Wales helps find, found it. Um, It's kind of the last thing she asks for in her will is the entire estate to be liquidated and the money to go towards founding a school for orphans and disadvantaged children. Um, So she is way ahead of her time. Uh, They're doing the same type of work and even more work than the founding hospital in London was. Uh, A lot of people are now familiar with Eliza Hamilton's um, hospital, or not hospital, uh, orphanage in New Mm -hmm. York, Mm -hmm. which was founded a little bit earlier than this. But she's doing essentially the same amount of work in a smaller area, bringing in tons of children uh, whose families either can't afford to have them or just the families are dead. Now, help me remember, too, um, something with her name on it, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was just named in her honor, is a school for nursing or was a school for nursing. It, does that still exist or what, I what happened there? I don't believe that exists anymore. That okay. might have been part of the charity school. And you'd okay. have to talk with um, the the school closed in the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. Um, and it then got turned into the Charity Roach Foundation. And they provide scholarships. That's what I'm thinking Usually of. for vocational students. So you get a lot of nursing students. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the really amazing thing about this school is it was co-ed, which, first of all, is really kind of radical and... Mm-hmm the 1820s 1830s um it's possibly the first vocational school in ohio and we are fairly positive that it's one of the first vocational and academic school combinations in the united states at the time Uh, so she is decades possibly centuries ahead of her time yeah and making sure young women got educated Mm -hmm. and making sure people of color were free yes in, just incredible. When you, uh, boy, in our last minute here in the first <laughs> segment, can you tell us a little bit about how the home reflects her? Because you still see her fingerprints everywhere, yes. don't you? Yes. Um, unfortunately, because she had the estate liquidated, we don't have as many things from her as possible. Mm-hmm. We do have the dining room has been lovingly nicknamed Charity's Room because we have most of her possessions in that room. It's a barometer. It's little things that she brought back with her from New England to Ohio and trying to bring that touch of civility into mm-hmm. the wilderness. <laughs> um, but there's also uh, probably one of my favorite things is we do have one of the original diplomas from her school, um, kind of as a testament to her and all of her hard work. Mm. My goodness. All right. We are visiting with Sammy Kay. She is from Spring Hill Historic Home, Spring Hill Farm, and we've got so much more. It's a fascinating story. It is. And uh, we'll be back. Stay with us. You're listening to Our Community.